More Adventures of the Great Brain by John D. Fitzgerald and illustrated by Mercer Mayer. Chapter 1, Part 1. The Night the Munster Walked. There were two good reasons for the people in Aidenville to celebrate Christmas in 1896, besides the birth of Jesus Christ. It was the year that Utah became the 45th state and the year everybody in town believed my brother Tom had reformed. Papa went around with a happy look, believing he no longer had to worry about Tom making a fool out of him. Mama was all smiles, believing no angry mother or father would be calling her on the telephone to complain my brother had swindled their son out of something. Aunt Bertha looked as if Tom had suddenly sprouted wings. Uncle Mark, who was the marshal and deputy sheriff, thought all he had to deal with in the future would be lawbreakers. It was the first Christmas parents bought presents for their sons, believing my brother wouldn't try to connive their kids out of them. There was only one doubter in our midst. That was my older brother, Swin. When he came home from the Christmas home for the Christmas holidays from the Catholic Academy in Salt Lake City, Aidenville only had a population of about 2,500 people. About 2,000 were Mormon and the rest Catholics and Protestants. We had a one-room schoolhouse where Mr. Standish taught the first through the sixth grades. My parents, who wanted their children to get more education, had to send them to Salt Lake City. There were plenty of places in Salt Lake City where the Mormons could send their kids for a higher education because the saints, as they prefer to be called, outnumbered other religions by 10 to 1. And there was more than one academy for the Protestants in the state capital, but only one Catholic academy. Swin was 13. He was named after my Danish grandfather on my mother's side and had blonde hair like Mama. I was now eight years old and would soon be nine. Tom was going on 12. I had dark curly hair and brown eyes like Papa. Tom didn't look like Mama exactly, and he didn't look like Papa. His hair wasn't blonde and it wasn't dark. He was the only one in the family who had freckles. What has happened to the great brain? Swin asked me two days after his arrival home, as we were stringing popcorn to help decorate our Christmas tree. He hasn't tried to connive me out of a single thing since I've been home. Teedy has reformed, I said. My brother and I always called each other by the initials of our first and middle name, because that is how Papa addressed us. We all had the middle name of Dennis, just like Papa, because it was a family tradition. Swin held the darning needle threaded with a string in one hand and a piece of popcorn in the other hand. He stared at me like a plum, a plum loco. Bushwah, he said. That little conniver could no more reform than he could wash the freckles off his face. I had never heard the word bushwah before and assumed it was a city slang word that Swin had picked up at the academy, but I knew what it meant just from the way he said it. I told him how Tom's great brain had helped Andy Anderson so he wasn't useless anymore of his peg leg, and how Tom had refused to accept the erector set he had been promised as payment if he helped. Andy learned to do his chores and play peg leg and all. And I told Swin how Tom had given me back my genuine Indian beaded belt, which he had swindled me out of earlier in the year. Teedy hasn't pulled a crooked stunt since, I concluded. Swin thought about what I had told him for a moment. Once a conniver, always a conniver, Swin said. It doesn't sound like T.D. at all. Mr. and Mrs. Anderson both thanked Papa and Mama for what Tom had done for their son, I said, and I told them about, how, about him giving me back my belt. Swin got a sly look on his face. And what else did T.D. get you to tell Papa and Mama? Well, I said, he did ask me to tell them he had his heart set on getting a bicycle for Christmas. He even got me to tell them the one... He wanted at the ZCMI store. Zion's Cooperative at Mercantile Institute was the full name of this town's big general store owned by the Mormon Church. Some people called it the ZCMI store, and some called it the co-op. Ha ha! Swen exclaimed. I knew it. T.D. with his cunning mind figured that a bicycle was worth more than a rector said it or an old beaded belt. This pretending to reform is all an act to get Papa and Mama to give him a bike for Christmas. Sure enough, Tom got his bike for Christmas. I got a new wagon. Swing got a pocket watch and a watch fob. I guess it was about the happiest Christmas of my life because it was the first time I didn't have to worry about Tom trying to swindle me out of my present. 
Swin still had his doubts and put them into words just before he left to return to the Academy in Salt Lake City. I'll bet ten to one, J.D., he said, that the great brain resumes his career as a confidence man now that he has his bike. My oldest brother was sure right. Tom started out the new year in his usual conniving style. It wouldn't have been so bad if it had been just one of his usual swindles. But this one got so complicated that armed men patrolled the streets of Aidenville, and women and children had to remain behind locked doors.